Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Economics Design Podcast. My name is Ari Kimmelman. I'm a research analyst with Economics Design. And today, I'm very excited to be joined once again by my colleague, Sasha Ulitsky, and our special guest for today, Paul Frambeau, the co-founder and CEO of the DeFi protocol Morpho. Morpho is a peer-to-peer -peer layer built on top of the lending pools Aave and Compound and provides individuals with optimal lending and borrowing rates through its peer-to-peer -peer design compared to the pool-to-peer design of Aave and Compound. Morpho has facilitated the borrowing of around $90 million since its release in June, and I anticipate this number will grow into the billions in the not-so-far future. So with that said, thank you two for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me as well. I'm very excited to, to talk to you on, on different subjects, I believe, than what we currently tackle on podcast. I'm really excited about this one. And Great. Um, so let's start off with some introductions. Sasha and Paul, can we get you guys to introduce yourselves, please? Yep, Sasha, I'll let you go first. Uh. Okay, thanks. So, hi, everyone. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I am Sasha, long version is Alexander. I'm head of DeFi at Economics Design. And uh, prior to joining the team, I have spent 10 years in corporate finance. So happy to be here with you guys. And uh, on my end, uh, as you mentioned, CEO of Morpho Labs, uh, we were building the Morpho protocol uh, before that, I was doing research in decentralized algorithms and consensus algorithms. And then I went into smart contracts, blockchain and everything, and then DeFi. So I've been in the space for, for six years now, mostly focused on tech and, and research, and now building Morpho, which is a great mechanism designed for, for, for DeFi. That's, that's it for me. Great. So for today's conversation, I would like to first outline what the protocol is, how it works, and what problems it solves. And then I would like to dive into a general discussion about the risks of using the protocol, Morpho's future, as well as the future of DeFi in general. So Paul, to start us off, start us off the conversation, uh, could you please explain how the Morpho protocol works? Yeah, definitely. So there's different ways I can explain Morpho, but the easiest way to describe it is that it's a learning protocol. So from a product perspective, from a user perspective, it's everything like Avel Compound that you everybody already knows. So you lend and borrow crypto assets in a novel collateralized fashion. Uh, if you want to borrow USDC, you supply like 150 of ETH, for example. And the particularity of Morpho is that it's built on top of existing lending protocols. So you have Morpho Compound, which is on top of Compound. You have Morpho Aave, which is on top of Aave. And we are going to introduce a layer of a matching engine that is going to optimize the efficiency of the existing lending protocols. So to explain how it works, maybe we can tackle a little bit what's wrong with, with current implementation. So if you, if you go to Aave or Compound websites, you'll notice that there is a huge spread between the lending and the borrowing side. So you have a very low APY to lend. It's like currently, I think it's 0 0.5 or 0.6% on USDC on Aave, I think. And it has been so for, for months now which is a bit worrying compared to Fed rates, for example. But on the other end, you have the borrowing rate, which is very high. Like it's like 2% or 3%. So you have a huge difference between the lending and the borrowing side. And the reason is that in, in Aave or Compound, profits or interests generated by the few borrowers, because you have very few borrowers, are shared across the numerous lenders. And you have this imbalance between lenders and borrowers. And and borrowers are going to pay interest for everybody. And in Morpho, basically, the idea is very simple, is that it's Morpho Compounds is going to try to match users peer-to-peer -peer in the middle. So instead of lending at one or borrowing at three, well, on Morpho Compound, you'll be lending and borrowing at 2%. So it's better for lenders, it's better for borrowers, it's much more capital efficiency than existing models. And uh, yeah, so that's the general concept, of course, can, we can go much deeper than that, but I'll leave that for the rest of the, the conversation. Great. Uh, Sasha, is there anything you would like to add on to that? Overall, when I, I found out about Morpho, I was really impressed. The core principle is really it's genuinity in its simplicity. So it's really a simple one, but it really brings what I would call a new breed of lending protocols. And this symbiosis of working with other protocols is also an interesting way in a Web3 where we usually have more stylist depths 
now we're seeing a more integrated devs and or on one hand it, it intrigues me on the other hand yeah there are some new portion of risks that unlocks with that behavior so it yeah it, it, I'm looking forward to learn more and dig how how more for guys are thinking about this great so before we dive into really the details I would love to hear a little bit from Paul about when he was first introduced to DeFi and really, Paul, what inspired you to pursue this protocol and create it? So before DeFi, I was mainly focused on blockchain, layer one blockchains, and I was like doing consensus algorithms. So it's quite far right from DeFi, to be honest. And I was like on a PhD track, so I was about to start a PhD. And really, I got into a research group uh, in my research center at the time, and we were all modeling DeFi protocols from a theoretical point of view. Like we're just having fun, like formalizing the protocols and measuring some parameters, like their efficiency, what makes sense about them, what does not make sense about them. And I really fell in love with mechanism design in general, like just liking to, you know, try to assemble the DeFi Legos in some other ways to build something new or also creating new primitives. And so during many, many months, uh, I just had fun playing around with the different concepts and assembling them in, in different ways. And we had a, a quite cool ideas in, in this think tank that we were having with with multiple other researchers. And one of the, the cool, so we had many cool ideas, but one of the cool ideas was more for, so it was purely like, I would say intellectual interest in the first place, but then turned into something much bigger because we ended up doing MoFo. And when we came with the first ideas of the design of MoFo, we were like, hey, is there something wrong with current designs in, in landing protocols? And not only there is something wrong, but there is also something we can do about it. And uh, put together, you, we came up with, with MoFo. So this is how the, the, the whole thing started. Yeah, in, in the early days, I would say. Neat. And I know that there's going to be a token introduced within the protocol. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more information about how that'll work. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the MoFo token is, so the smart contract is live and the token is currently distributed, but it's not transferable. So the MoFo token is currently distributed to MoFo users, so lenders and borrowers. However, lenders and borrowers can accumulate the MoFo token, but they cannot transfer it. Okay, so there is no market for it. There is no price for it. And to us, it was a, a clean and, and neat way to decentralize the protocol and as well as aligning users for the long term, right? So the, the token is is not transferable so the only thing you can do is hold for the moment but you're still incentivized to come in because you can expect that this at the, the token at the time it will be transferable will will have a value of course and so we thought that we as Morpho Labs as a software development uh, company we were not like we felt like we should not be the only one to decide on some very important like questions about the protocol and so because of this uh, we decided to um, to basically um, introduce a non-transferable token with which the community is going to be able to accumulate it, but also to have governance power and so to, to participate in Morpho's governance even before the token is, is transferable, if that makes sense. So that's the current state of the token. Obviously, we have a lot of different things that we want to be doing around this token. Actually, maybe not so many things, but we've been doing a lot of thinking about what we want it to be why it makes sense, why it, why it, where it should make sense, where it should not make sense. All those kind of questions that we can, of course, discuss if that's relevant, maybe a bit later. I uh, hear just, just, just a question. I think I saw your thread on Twitter uh, about uh, distributing early incentives in the form of tokens where you find market fit. So I want to, 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 uh, to dig more deeper here. You're thinking with Morphos of how you distribute your tokens even now when they're not tradable, so what you reward for and where are you in this finding your product market fit with Morpho? So actually Morpho's product, we have a very good chance with it, is that, so the team is mostly technical, you know, so we, we're, we're 17, 15 of us are, are tech guys. So we're, we're not like the, the, the great uh, marketer and, and business developer that you, uh, some protocols have. Uh, and the, the thing we've built with Morpho is quite funny because Arvin Compound, we could argue that they reach some sort of product market fit, at least at the DeFi range of things. Like you could argue like in 
traditional usage is, is definitely not a product market fit, but in, in the DeFi space, they did reach something. And what's cool with Wofo is that it's a mathematical Pareto improvement of existing lending protocols. So it's very cool because it's kind of, you know, by design, a product market fit, right? Because you, you have to look at those compound and AVA users you talk to them, you explain them, and once they are sufficiently educated about what MoFo is, well, they decide to switch from the one to the other. And this is what we're experiencing with all the compound and AVE users at the moment, is that we reach out to them one by one, we explain to them one by one what MoFo is about, and at some point they understand and they make the switch. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we've been doing, and I'm, I'm pretty excited to see to say that the, the the just maybe one one last thing about it is that the last two weeks have been full of a great announcement about like protocols integrating Morpho instead of Compound or Aave directly to enhance their yield. So you have Spool, Sense, uh, Origin protocol with OUSD. Uh, so the OUSD stablecoin will be backed by Morpho. The Vault stablecoin is going to be backed by Morpho and. Those are like the uh, not the most important one that we have uh, in the pipeline because we have uh, a lot to to announce still. But uh, unfortunately, there's nothing public at the moment. So just on the prior note, so and it's probably one of the core things for me to understand with this pair Morpho and Compound or Morpho and Aua. Uh, so how they see you as a partner versus uh, as a threat because it it really feels as you're cannibalizing them. But on one hand, on the other hand, the whole construct is you need them to have a lot of liquidity. So how you balance the things in this setup? I think it's a very interesting topic. And uh, we've been discussing a lot of it uh, internally, but also with the Aave team and the Compound team. And here are some, some thoughts uh, about this topic. So maybe first is that it's very complicated to model. So if you try to model it in one way and say, hey, every user is going to move to Morpho, uh, what's going to happen on Aave and Compound. If you change the initial hypothesis, it could go either way, right? So it's kind of hard to say, but here are some like hints uh, that could be helpful to have in mind. So the first thing is that it is true that every user of Compound has a direct interest in moving to Morpho Compound, or Aave user has a direct interest in moving to Morpho Aave. But then you could imagine the following, is that every single user is going to uh, Morpho, and then uh, everybody gets matched, so you don't have any more borrowers on Aave, so you don't have the borrowers on Aave, so you don't have... Like, uh, I'm a th in a theoretical world, of course. Uh, this is absolutely not the case at the moment. But let's imagine, uh, and let's push the system, like, like forward. So every borrower is now coming to Morpho, which means that the excess liquidity that was on Aave is not earning any yield anymore. And in that case, then the yield is going to... You, the, the liquidity is going to leave to find to find another venue. And in that case, Morpho, uh, Aave and Aave are not liquid anymore, which means that the world system is not going to work anymore. N neither Aave or, or Morpho, which is not something we're looking to do. Uh, but you have this, but this is only considering the current interest model. So like uh, Morpho has a peer-to-peer -peer APY that is in the middle of the supply and, and the borrow rate. But you could imagine that if you reach such level of uh, dangerousness, you could change those risk models, you could change those interest rate models because we're very far away to such systems. But what I want to say basically is that Morpho is a mathematical object. We don't aim to be adversary at all. We don't aim to be neither friendly to be honest we just want to be like objectively the best for the end user and discussing a lot with compound with Aave they, they are perfectly fine with it because they feel two things the first thing is that Morpho is enabling a better rate for the world DeFi space right a better native rate so if you take away every incentives and every token yield that is you know pumped by a, a governance token at some point you remove all that Morpho is taking DeFi to a, a level of efficiency that was not possible before. And so theoretically, it opens a, a wider market. So of course, Morpho is going to take market shares. But on the other hand, Morpho, Morpho is going to increase the buy for everybody, which is a, a good thing. And in any case, in a market where you have like more supply than borrow or more borrow than supply, the excess liquidity will be uh, sent to, to Aave. So Aave will profit from that, for example. So this is another way of thinking about it. Yeah, so does that 
start to answer the question already? Or maybe you want to, to guide me through another direction? Or is that... Yeah, I think I'm getting it. So mathematically, there still will be, uh, as, let's say, liquidity rebalances between our and Morpheus, it will be somewhere in equilibrium just because the rates will be changing and it, it, it's not possible to absorb fully from one to one. So theoretically, we could. We, we could theoretically. But in practice, you have smart contracts that are hard-coded with Aave, right? They're not going to move any soon, right? And also there is the fact that Morpho's yield is determined after Aave's yield. So if the Aave's yield goes down, then Morpho's yield too. So then you have uh, an interest in the end game, not now, but in the end game to have like people using Aave just to arbitrage the rates and make them higher for everybody. So it's, it's really non-trivial and it's very complex to figure out like uh, in, in simple terms what's going to happen. But what we basically said with Aave and Compound is that in the end, the market is going to decide an equilibrium between the two, right? Between like, you could say the layer one and the layer two of, of the DeFi protocols. If Morpho stays the same as it is right now, but uh, maybe we can mention it after we have like other plans and other things we're going to be doing in, in the future as well. So I want to, I was taking a look at the platform last week and I saw there was about a 50% match rate for the peer to peer. Uh, is that correct? So yeah, so the match rate can be defined in many different ways. So the way it was defined at the time on the front end uh, is the following. It's like you take a market, you see how many, how many people are matched peer to peer. So if you have like 100 suppliers and 50 borrowers, in terms of dollars, I mean, $50 of borrowing volume and $100 of lending volume, then you're going to have a match rate of 50% for lenders. And this is very hard to find. The, the, we've been discussing a lot about like what should be the, the right metric to expose that, that efficiency. And this one could seem relevant. You know, it makes some sort of sense. But on, on the other way around, you could, you could argue that's 100% right. Everybody that could be matched was matched. And so you could say it's 50%, but you could also say it's 100%, depending on what you want to express. The, the general thinking about Morpho's matching engine is that around 99.9% .9 of the liquidity that could find a match meaning that you had suppliers in front of borrowers when Morpho was able to actually match them, like 99.9% .9 of the time. But if you look at all the markets, there is always an imbalance between lenders and borrowers. And this imbalance is, in average, makes the fact that 50% of all users are matched peer-to-peer -peer because you have sometimes more lenders and those lenders are going to end up on Aave or on Compound, for example. And in terms of the uh, borrowers and lenders, do you see difference between who is going to or staying with Aave and who is coming to Morpho. Because when I was thinking about this, again, if you construct Morpho plus Aave, that Morpho is taking like more retail clients and Aave is sitting with more institutional guys. So, or uh, it doesn't matter. It's uh, the same folks on both sides. Theoretically, it does not matter. Now in practice, Aave is a more trusted brand. Like, let's be honest, Morpho is quite new. So, like, more risk-averse users would stay on Aave for a longer time, I would say. So that's the first point. But theoretically, they have no interest in, like, not moving from Aave to Morpho Aave. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, that's, like, we, we don't make any difference between retail users or, or smart contract users or protocols or DAOs or, or businesses. And I mean, in terms of practical, so you also don't see that I know people on Morpho are taking smaller chunks, I know smaller loans and making smaller deposits compared to our where average ticket is higher. So there is no such differences. So actually at the moment, it's mostly retails uh, because the reason is that retails move much faster than institutionals. But institutionals or DAOs or protocols, of course, uh, because it's more heavy, there is a lot more liquidity to move, etc. But that's just for now. And uh, I think, for example, tomorrow morning, Vault Stablecoin is going to deposit their PCV. So all their collateral that was previously held into Compound is going to be deposited on Morpho Compound. After a, a governance vote, it could be the same for, for Origin uh, US dollar that is also backed by Compound for now. And that they are now integrating Morpho Compound. So. This kind of users, but you know, it took us like three months to reach, you know, some of the, the first protocol integrations like this one. That's interesting. So my personal perspective on the protocol, it's, it's really simply a matter of time before a whole lot more people begin using the protocol. 
uh, compared to Aave or Compound for that matter. So I'm wondering from the team's perspective, uh, what factors do you think will most influence a user onboarding over the next half a year to year? I think it mostly have been branding and developers relations. So we, for a long time, we were like too small of a team to handle integration and help with integration and, you know, guide people through it. And even though if it's very simple, right, you always have to explain to people what it is, etc. And I was pretty much the only one like doing the course and everything. And now we are, uh, we, we grew from, from five to, to 17 in, in a year. And, and now we have much more brilliant uh, persons that can help me out and help integrators as well. Uh, along the way so that's the first thing and second thing is that we have to work a bit more on the awareness uh, so our twitter account was banned uh, two days ago so that does not help but uh, but still uh, we 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 just hired uh, a brilliant uh, marketer uh, recently and uh, we actually two days ago as well and uh, we are basically looking to scale that part as well because too many people do not know about morpho uh, yet to be honest that's interesting. I would like to jump into a little bit of a discussion now about identifying some of the risks of using the protocol. I know we touched on it a little bit earlier, but in a little bit more detail now. So uh, my question is, because essentially the risks are identical to using Aave and Compound, you have to now rely on the DAOs in, in some senses to measure the stability of the Morpho protocol. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this point and whether you see it as being an advantage because people are already aware of these risks or perhaps as a disadvantage because you now don't have necessarily the same control as the Aave team, for example. Yes, so so first thing is that from a, a market perspective, like uh, Morpho does copy on-chain the exact same parameters as Aave or compound, so you have like the same collateralization ratio, the same LTV, LT, the same liquidation bonus, and uh, the same oracle. So it's 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 the same, right? However, Morpho introduces more lines of code, and this is something that people should be aware of: is that you have additional smart contract risk using Morpho because you have more lines of code, and we've been doing like a huge amount of audits. Like I don't know, I think. Is we're getting close to 15 different audits in this year only, which is like huge for a DeFi protocol. Usually protocols don't go over like two or three at maximum. And we've been doing like 15. And the reason is that we know that smart contract risk is probably one of the only thing that separates a user from, you know, using the protocol basically. So uh, smart contract risk uh, like that we, you know, mediate through audits, but we also have formal proving so more f so internally we have formal provers and people that hold a PhD in formal proving. Uh, we're also working with Sertora, which is the most famous formal proving company in the space, and we basically formalize the protocol, prove it formally, and uh, introduce a model for the code and prove that formal to the code. Uh, with automatic formal proving. So that's a, a lot of work. We have internally a paper of uh, 80 pages long formalizing the protocol and, and proving it. By the way, that we're going to really soon. But still, there is like smart contract risk uh, yeah, additional. Now you have like the DAO risk, which is, I would say, to be considered as well. It's a bit, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe you can like elaborate on what you meant by the DAO risk. Sasha, do you want to jump in there and discuss some of the risks you identified when reviewing the protocol? Yeah, so on the DAO, probably, as, as you mentioned, Paul, so you're basically replicating the parameters uh, of our, for example, if you're integrating your, uh, with our, so meaning you're always dependent on DAO decisions of our. If the DAO decides to change their parameters, it means you also need to change them immediately just to keep the mirror, right? So that's also something that, let's say, landing parameters are out of your control as a Morpho. It's more at the control of Aave DAO. That's kind of risk we see. Yes, so it's not in the control of Morpho, but Morpho is like a pretty plain smart contract, right? It does not hold any liquidity in itself. It's just the same thing as Aave. So if Aave, Aave judges that Morpho is like that, the collateral factor for Bitcoin should be uh, I don't know, like uh, 30%, then Morpho is naturally going to follow that. I mean, it's a good thing that we follow exactly what Have has been doing for their for their, their perimeters. And, and here, just to make a theoretical example, and I think one of the, uh, 
to, to make a step back, one of the benefits of Morpho compared to Aave, or e even if we can look at them in traditional terms, so Aave is like narrow banking. So whatever is in deposits is in loans. So all loans are backed, while Morpho allows to have more loans and lending that actually has as a deposits because you're kind of using also Aave. So you're more like a modern banking where loans can create deposits. And here can be like a potential risk constructed where uh, at some point of time, there can be no deposits on the Morpho, but still, still uh, have outstanding lending because you're using the collateral to borrow from Aave. Here, I'm interested in how your mechanics work Let's say if there is a certain liquidation event, because you have this, the same parameters as on AVA, right? It's one to one. So whenever it's a liquidation event, it means it immediately happens on AVA and on Morpho at the same time. But collateral is held by AVA, so you can't cannot sell anything because you don't hold it until AVA does their liquidation event. So how you manage that? Or it's a theoretical risk, I get. No, it's, so it's it's not exactly the way it's handled in the protocol. So maybe I can like. Uh, give a little bit more in information on the way it's done. Or if, if I get you right, but let's try the thought experiment. So let's say I'm lending 100 die. Okay, so I'm going to lend, and I'm the very first user of Morpho Aave. So I'm lending 100 die to Morpho, and Morpho is going to deposit that into Compound. Okay, uh, into Aave, sorry. So then uh, another user is going to deposit some ETH. Okay, and this is is going to be deposited into, let's say, like uh, Aave. And now I want to borrow, uh, let's say, USDC with my ETH okay, as a second user. So Mofo is going to look for peer-to-peer -peer match. There is no USDC depositor, so Mofo is going to take a loan on Aave in order to give the money to the borrower. Okay, and here the liquidation can happen on, on Mofo, but it could not happen on Aave, right? Because Aave, the only thing that Aave sees is Morpho as a protocol using Aave, which has deposited 100 DAI and one ETH and has borrowed 100 USDC. And so in that scenario, the liquidation can only happen on Morpho, right? It, it, maybe I'm not getting the problem right. I think I get your point. So Aave looks at you as, as aggregation of assets. So M Morpho is a single user which is an aggregation of every single user using Morpho. And that's very interesting because you have very, very good properties uh, going out of this. Like for example, you have very healthy position because it's the sum of like the, basically Morpho as a user is very healthy because it is the average of all its users that are all healthy because if they're not healthy, they get liquidated. So it's very healthy position. And you have a ton of very interesting properties about this. Uh, but we, we don't really have the time. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I, I just, maybe a quick one. Do you have some like concentration restrictions? I know in certain asset class, like we, we, we cannot handle more than this amount of ease as a portion of all assets, or we cannot have this amount of loan concentrated within borrower just to avoid situation where this, let's say, general morpho position on Aave is not becoming net loan rather than uh, net deposit. So is there any restrictions? Restrictions on the Morpho protocol or on the Aave protocol? Yes, on, on the Morpho protocol level. N no, it's it's fully permissionless and also like we don't have... Of course, if there are limits in the Aave protocol, then Morpho is going to have those limits implemented. But there is no additional limits compared to Aave. Okay, and probably on the risk, on the risk side, maybe for users also. So there is movement of assets by Morpho and borrowing, lending, so Morpho using, can you use collateral? So is it fully algorithmical, al algorithmically managed? So there is no hand touch, what to place where, so? Except for liquidators. So liquidators are of, of chain, of course, uh, but let's keep in mind that the liquidators of Morpho are, are different from the liquidators of Aave. So it, it turns out that liquidators of Morpho are very performance. They have made a lot of money on Morpho already, <laughs> uh, but uh, but still they are different. So theoretically, you could argue that the risk is different. But I mean, like yeah, it's it's very very minimum to be honest. Great. So now that we've discussed some of the risks, I'd love to discuss um, a little bit about the future of DeFi. So Sasha actually just wrote a little bit of an article 
discussing what he perceives as being important for DeFi to actually become mainstream over the next couple of years. So Paul, it would be great uh, to hear some of your thoughts in terms of where you see DeFi going over the next couple of years. And then Sasha, we can get you to jump in there and share some of your thoughts. Definitely. This is a, a topic that I love because I think it's not tackled enough, uh, to be honest. You know, when I look at the DeFi space, I see like mostly like DEXs, lending and stable codes. Of course, you have a lot of other different things, but most of the stuff is built on top of those primitives. And if you take a look at DEXs, Uniswap has done a tremendous job. Like Uniswap V3 is super, super capital efficient uh, compared to other primitives in the DeFi space. And it's reaching levels of efficiency that is interesting for traditional finance as well. And traditional finance players are getting more and more interested into Uniswap, into using a Uniswap, because not only is it like decentralized, but also uh, it has uh, an efficient algorithm. So you have all the costs, in infrastructure costs, reduction of, of being on chain, of being a DeFi primitive and not being a bank, plus decentralization, plus a ef sufficiently efficient mechanism, uh, which is quite cool. In lending though, uh, it's not the case, to be honest. Like if, if you look at Aave again, we mentioned it in the beginning, rates are so low, like it's 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 not really something you could argue to be like the future of uh, of finance compared like I mean last year all the DeFi community was having fun uh, making fun of like traditional finance rates and was saying hey look at you uh, we have twenty percent fixed rates on DeFi you have like uh, zero point five and now it's our turn to be at zero point five and traditional finance is at four four percent. And my point here is that because of token governance tokens being emitted like crazy, we we have hidden mechanism designs that were not so the most relevant in my opinion. Okay, so it's a personal take here is that I feel like we could be improving even more lending and stablecoin space. And so I know about lending, so I would specifically say lending. So when you look at Compound and Harvey, having such a spread is not so efficient, to be honest. And it's also due to the constraints of blockchain, right? It's, you have only uh, very heavy, like, gas constraints. So you can't do, like, order books. You can't do uh, very complicated multidimensional algorithms like, like a lending al algorithm would, would require. But still, there are things that you could do. And Morpho is an attempt to one of those things. So my point is that, just to wrap up here, is that in order to take DeFi to the next level, I would argue that first, we need mechanism designs that are competitive with traditional finance, which is not the case at the moment in terms of rates. And second, user experience, which is completely separated. But like, uh, so what I mean by user experience is also developer experience. It's like all the pitfalls and op operational hurdles to get into DeFi, uh, whether it's holding or managing private keys, whether it's like, transferring crypto to a smart contract address that is not verified or not properly audited, all these kind of operational aspects of things, which is a big challenge. And then you have other topics like under collateralized lending, etc. But to me, it's really not, not so much the most important thing. Like the most important thing is this. And then you have obviously regulatory pitfalls, but this is like a separated subject that I'm not an expert about. Interesting. Sasha, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, probably building on, on the first uh, item mentioned. So it, it sounded a bit provocative one, like uh, in its core, DeFi lending is is broken. Because if you think from foundational of the lending in itself, it taking money from those who have it in excess and distributing to those who have less and they're able to build something like use for productive use rather than uh, used for own consumption or for speculation. Now, if we look at current DeFi, collateralization basically means that lending is accessible only to rich already people. Because if I want to build something, uh, but I don't have money, lending is closed for me, so I cannot borrow. And also, current lending, it due to the liquidation and again over collateralization rates, it it kind of motivates short-term speculation only. And it, the post overall uh, raised a big debate uh, about this. And uh, I think some, somebody also told that uh, lending currently is used for tax, tax avoidance. It's one of the vehicles as well, the DeFi lending itself. So currently it seems DeFi lending does not solve the purpose of more accessible finance for those who don't have money because they cannot use it. You need to place $120 to borrow $100. 
and uh, it it is optimized for speculation. Therefore, I think future of the landing should be somewhere in, in, in making it really for productive use where people can land something and build something, then adapt a protocol, and it will be beneficial, like win-win for everybody and for lenders and for the whole Web3 because the community, community is growing and, and more activity is happening. But I, I fully agree it, it should also come with simplicity and, and user experiences because for folks to uh, even interact with with the DEX, it, it takes the time to understand how it works and what it is. Yeah, thanks for throwing that in, Sasha. I, I really enjoyed the post. I, I thought it was a little bit of a hot take, and I think it's always great to have hot takes and not follow the mainstream narrative. And I, I think those are some excellent points that you raised. So, Paul, if there's anything um, you would like to add to that in response to what Sasha said, and if not, we can wrap up the conversation for today. No, I think it's good uh, on my hand. I think we had quite interesting conversations and and yeah thanks again for 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 having me on this podcast Mm -hmm. yeah it was wonderful having you too so that will conclude our conversation if you like this discussion please consider giving it a like and subscribing to our podcast and youtube channel for more videos like this Uh, if there's a specific topic you would like to hear please let us know in the comments or by sending us a message in the economics design discord chat thanks everyone thank you Adi. thank you paul bye bye bye